Hello, everyone. My name is Meredith Angel, and I'm an ECW Certified Implementation Specialist here at Ravel. Welcome to our Coronavirus COVID-19 and Telehealth Billing and Coding Updates webinar. All of the information here I want to say is up to date as of today, but as you know, this is a rather dynamic process with payers changing kind of their minds every day as far as what they're going to cover, how they want to build. Um, but as of today, this our information is up to date and we are constantly working around the clock to provide you all with the latest updates as well. So as I said, my name is Meredith Angel and on the line I have Kim White, who is one of our client performance managers, Marie Moss, our medical coding audits instructor, and myself. Today's agenda, we'll start with going through the specific coding for coronavirus as far as testing, confirmed cases, and reimbursement. We will then move into telehealth, telemedicine as a whole, and go through the emergency declaration codes, who is eligible to bill telehealth as that has expanded quite a bit during this time, the claim requirements, and we will finish up by working our way through an eClinical Works televisits demonstration. So to get started with, Marie um, will get us going here with the coronavirus testing. Thanks, Meredith. All right, so let's begin with the CPT HIPAA codes, um, first being with the laboratories. The CPT code U0001 is to be reported when the specimen is sent to the Centers of Disease Control or to a CDC-approved local state health department laboratory. CPT code U0002 is to be reported when specimens are sent to a commercial laboratory such as Quest or LabCorp. The Medicare claims processing system will be able to accept these codes on April 1st of 2020 for days of service on or after February 4th of 2020. For CPT code 87635, this is to be reported effective March 13th for dates of service beginning March 13th. The code 87635 is reported when using an amplified nucleic acid probe technique to identify the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the coronavirus disease, such as the COVID-19. CMS established two level two HIPAA codes effective with line item date of service on or after March 1st of 2020. These codes are billable by clinical diagnostic laboratories. First being the G2023, which is for independent labs, reporting um, this code when a trained laboratory technician collects a nasopharyngeal or, or an oral pharyngeal sputum or another type of specimen for the purpose of performing a laboratory test for the SARS CoV 2 virus. G2024 specimen is a specimen collection for severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, or known as the SARS CoV 2 coronavirus or the COVID 19. And this is from an individual in a skilled nursing facility or by a laboratory on behalf of a home health agency, any specimen source. For the CPT codes for reporting transferring specimen, you'll use the 99000, which is for handling and or conveyance of specimen for transfer from an office to a laboratory. 99001 is for handling and or conveyance of specimen for transfer from the patient in other than an office to a laboratory. And 99211 is for swabs collected at an office or a group practice testing site in which you would append modifier 25 if on the same day there is an assessment. Moving on to the diagnos diagnosis codes, our first set of diagnostic codes are to be used when patients have been exposed to the coronavirus. Code Z03.818 is an encounter for an observation for suspected exposure to other biological agents ruled out. So this is to be used when there's a concern about a possible exposure to the COVID-19, but this is ruled out after an evaluation. The other code is Z20.828. 
This is for when a patient becomes in contact with and there's a suspected exposure to other viral communicable diseases. This is to be used when there is an actual exposure to someone who is confirmed to have a COVID-19. Here is a list of signs and symptoms. These are the most common ones, but believe me, they are not excluded from the entire list. And um, being a cough, fever, fatigue, sore throat, and we just provided you some of the codes that go along with these signs, signs and symptoms. Moving on to cases. Um, first, um, for concerned patients, use diagnostic code Z71.84. This is for an encounter for health um, counseling related to traveling, especially international. The next one is Z71.1. This is for um, persons with feared health complaint in whom no diagnosis is made. For the confirmed cases, for dates of service of up to 331 of 2020, you'll want to report the respiratory condition followed by the B97.29, which is for other coronavirus as the cause of disease classified elsewhere. So an example would be to report J12.890. This is for other viral pneumonia and following it with the B97.29. For confirmed cases of dates of service beginning on April 1st of 2020, report diagnostic code U07.1 for the 2019 NCOV. Um, this is acute respiratory disease, plus use additional codes for respiratory disease, such as viral pneumonia J12.8, or signs or symptoms of the respiratory disease, such as shortness of breath, cough, as documented. The World Health Organization has published the U07.2 for the COVID-19. This is when the virus has not been identified. Um, it can be used to, to assign to a clinical diagnosis of the COVID-19 where laboratory confirmation is inconclusive or not available. Um, however, this um, code U07.2 is not part of the ICD-10 CM as of yet. So one of our questions we have seen is, are these codes in my e-clinical work system? Yes, excluding the U07.2, these codes are in your present system. If you are a Revell client, if you don't, if you are a Revell client and you don't see them, please reach out to your client success team for assistance. Okay, on January 30th, IMO released 15 new descriptors to help clinicians more accurately record diagnosis related to the COVID-19. Then on March 26th, they increased the number to 136 terms. IMO has also created an IMO precision COVID-19 sets, which includes two new value sets aimed at helping providers with workflow and cohort management connected to the coronavirus. IMO precision COVID-19 sets will be made available to all customers completely free of charge and helping them to one, leverage health information systems to identify and monitor patients who have documented COVID-19 problems and diagnosis. And the other is, and um, secondly, analyze the effectiveness of the institution's COVID-19 management protocol. So here you'll see a list of the IMO first 15 descriptors, which have been grouped together, such as the first three are for infections, the next three are for pneumonia, and then following that, you, know, you have your next um, three for exposures and on down. Each of these have a 2019 novel coronavirus, a 2019 NCOV and a Wuhan coronavirus descriptor. Now to Kim White. Thanks, Marie. Okay, so some of the items that we're going to cover will be about uh, claims and reimbursement in regards to COVID-19 uh, testing specifically. 
So the first question um, that we have still been getting is, can claims be submitted now for coronavirus testing or do they need to be held? So CMS became ready to accept claims on April 1st, 2020, which was last Wednesday, for dates of service effective February 4th, 2020 and forward until further notice. Now we do continuously research payer specific updates, but from what we're finding that um, so far is that most are following CMS guidelines, at least during this crisis. Um, so those claims are ready to be billed. Um, the next question, will patients be paying out of pocket for coronavirus testing? So this is to be determined by specific payers. However, under traditional Medicare, there's no beneficiary cost sharing for lab testing. And again, most payers are stating they will follow CMS guidelines. So there are many, um, and we'll talk about those a little bit more by specific plan that are waiving copays and, and things of that nature. Um, but then also, what are the average reimbursement rates for coronavirus testing from major carriers such as Blue Cross, United Healthcare, Aetna, et cetera? Um, so normally, whenever we get these types of questions that are service related, we do recommend clients to review their commercial payer contracts. But since these codes are new, many payers have still been working to determine those rates and release that information. But some of the specifics that we do have um, we'll talk about in this next slide. So Medicare, um, Medicare covers the lab test for COVID-19. The patient pays no out-of-pocket costs. Um, as of 3-19-2020, CMS announced that the test through the CDC will be reimbursed at $36, with tests from other entities being reimbursed at $51. However, prices may slightly vary depending on the provider's local Medicare administrative contractor, otherwise known as your MAC. Um, if you do have a Medicare Advantage plan, you have access to these same benefits, or your patients do. These plans are eligible, like Medicare, to allow cost sharing to be waived for COVID-19 lab tests. Specific to Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, as a whole, so they have stated that they are waiving prior authorizations for diagnostic tests and covered services, and that this does apply to fully insured patients, um, the individuals such as the commercial plans, Medicare Advantage plan members, and they are working with state Medicaid and CHIP agencies. Specific to United Healthcare, they've stated they are covering testing for coronavirus at approved locations for insured Medicaid and Medicare members. Um, so for Cigna, they have stated that they will allow copays or cost shares to be waived. And at this time, that is to be followed through May 31st, 2020. Aetna has stated they will waive member costs associated with diagnostic testing at any authorized location, such as Quest, LabCorp, places like that, for all commercial Medicare and Medicaid lines of business. So just kind of stepping outside of some of those common commercial plans, we'll briefly talk about catastrophic plans. So what is a catastrophic plan? Um, those plans are designed to have low premiums but still protect its enrollees from substantial medical debt if they suffer a catastrophic illness. So a couple common questions we've been getting about catastrophic plans um, we'll cover. The first one being, do catastrophic plans cover the diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19? And the answer is yes. Um, those plans must cover essential health benefits as required by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, but they are typically subject to limitations. So the specific coverage details and enrollee cost sharing will vary by plan. Some of those will require prior authorizations to be obtained uh, before services are eligible for coverage. But again, that's within the specific plans and many have been making um, exceptions, of course, during this public health emergency. So the second question, will the Department of Health and Human Services allow issuers of those plans to provide coverage even if an enrollee's deductible hasn't been met? And the answer is yes to that as well. The Department of Health and Human Services will not be taking action against any health issuer that amends their catastrophic plans to provide pre-deductible coverage for services related to the diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19. So last but not least in regards to reimbursement um, for COVID-19, we're briefly gonna talk about uninsured patients. So we have been asked commonly, 
will funding be available to diagnose or treat uninsured patients? And the answer is yes. Uninsured patients will be covered for COVID-19 diagnosis and treatment related costs. And that funding is going to come from the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, stated on Friday, April 3rd, 2020, that providers will be reimbursed at Medicare rates, but no outstanding balances can be billed to those uninsured patients. So already this morning, just with that coming out Friday, we're getting a lot of questions in from um, many clients is how will those claims be submitted? And the answer is we do not have that information yet. Um, that's not been released yet from CMS, but we are following this very closely and we'll update our website with information as soon as that becomes available. So now we're gonna move in and start talking about telehealth specifically. So I'm gonna start with briefly going over some information in regards to the emergency declaration. So on March 17, 2020, the Trump administration did announce that Medicare would expand telehealth or virtual visit coverage that allows beneficiaries to receive a wider range of healthcare services uh, from their providers without having to worry about traveling to a healthcare facility. And then beginning on March 6, 2020, Medicare stated they will temporarily pay approved providers to service those beneficiaries requiring, residing across the entire country through telehealth. Um, so a few of the highlights of that emergency declaration that we're gonna cover are the telehealth waiver, the provider and patient being at separate locations, telehealth not being limited to COVID-19, and telehealth Medicare reimbursement. So some more specifics on that. The telehealth waiver will be effective until the public health emergency is declared as ended by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So that was stated on January 31st, 2020, and will continue on until the emergency is considered um, at a close. Uh, services should only be reported as telehealth services when the individual physician or professional providing the telehealth service is not as at the same location as the beneficiary. So obviously in a lot of these cases, the patient is in their home and that provider is not there. So it's not considered a, a home type visit. Telehealth services are not limited to COVID-19, but visits must be reasonable and necessary. And then Medicare will pay the same amount for telehealth services as it would if the service were furnished in person. So for services that have different rates in the office versus the facility, Medicare uses the facility payment rate when services are furnished via telehealth. So that's gonna be driven off a of place of service and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, but you will have the zero two place of service where that will process per a facility payment rate and then the other places of service um, you know, possibly even where the service would have been rendered had this emergency not been going on, um, that would be processed at a non-facility rate as long as it is like an office setting or something of that nature. Um, a few of the items that I'm just going to give a brief overview on before we, before I pass it back over to Marie to go into some specifics on telehealth coding um, is just going to be the, we're going to cover this chart and then briefly cover a uh, Revell decision map that we've come up with to help guide you guys through um, knowing based on what service you're doing, what code that you need to be billing. So specifically for telehealth, the codes that will be billed for what Medicare actually defines as Medicare telehealth services will typically be standard e and office visit codes. So examples of that are your 99213s or your 99214s along with the telehealth place of service um, and potentially a modifier if required by commercial payers. Now, again, you'll notice that I said telehealth place of service, but that, that is the standard telehealth definition during this public health emergency. There are those exceptions uh, being made, which I briefly spoke about and we'll talk about a little bit more later. Virtual-based visits, so the Medicare communications-based technology definition will be codes um, being split into two different service types, such as a virtual check-in or an e-visit. So neither of those types of visits are deemed by CMS to be Medicare telehealth services, which means they're not subject to typical statutory restrictions regarding your originating site or rural geography, though, of course, CMS has lifted those during this public health emergency. So specifically uh, for virtual check-ins, a virtual check-in is non-face-to-face. It's a brief 
typically five to 10 minute communication initiated by the patient with a practitioner via telephone or other telecommunications advice to determine if an office visit is in fact needed. Normally virtual check-ins do require an established patient relationship, which is of course seen by the provider within the last three years. But as of March 30th, 2020, that was waived by CMS due to this public health emergency until further notice. A virtual check-in cannot be related to a medical visit within the previous seven days and cannot lead to a medical visit within the next 24 hours or the soonest appointment available that that provider has. Specifically for e-visits, so those are non-face-to-face -face as well. Um, e-visits are different from telehealth visits because they must occur through an online patient portal. Both MDs and mid-levels are eligible to bill for this service. Uh, this code series is also time-based and specific documentation requirements must be met. So now we'll move into uh, briefly looking at the decision map that Ravel has, has put together. Okay, so the first one we have here is um, regarding virtual check-in. So basically the way both these decision maps will work, I'm not gonna walk through the whole thing, because again, as Meredith stated, you guys will get copies of these slides um, at the end of the presentation, but this is to help you walk through if you're able to bill for a virtual check-in or not. So if you start at the top and just answer those questions going all the way down, that will help you determine whether you can bill, and if you can bill, what are the appropriate codes to use? So as you can see with this one at the top, does the patient need to be seen? If you determine yes, then that's something you're not gonna be able to bill for. But if you determine they do not need to be seen and you're wanting to know if you can bill, of course, now there's that exclusion that it does include new patients and established patients as well, um, that it will walk through for you if they've been seen in the last seven days that you can't bill. Um, or that you can bill and those appropriate codes, starting with the G2012 all the way down to 98966 through the 98968 series. And then the decision map on the next page follows the same logic, but it is specific to e-visits and telehealth. So you're gonna start at the top with that um, to determine whether it's an e-visit or telehealth, is the visit being done through an online patient portal or other telecommunication system? Um, you'll see in most of these scenarios that you are able to bill, but it is, you are going to have different codes that you bill um, based on the type of service, based on the type of provider who's doing the service and things of that nature. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Marie, who will give us um, some more education in regards to um, all of these specific codes. Thank you, Kim. Oh, yes. Let's dive deeper into the telehealth and virtual visits here. Um, telehealth codes are the standard office visit codes being 99201 through 99215. Telehealth services are performed through an audio video communication device. With this, the examination component of an ENM will be limited. At most, would be an expanded problem focus examination being the limited examination of the affected body area or areas or organ system and any other symptomatic or related body area or areas or organ system. Keep in mind, a new patient office visit requires three of the three components being history, examination, um, and medical decision making. And an established patient office visit requires only two of those three components. When billing professional claims for a non-traditional telehealth service with dates of service on or after March 1st of 2020, and for the duration of the public health emergency, bill the place of service equal to what is, it would have been in the absence of the um, public health emergency. Office visit codes 99201 through 99215 are traditional health um, telehealth services. For the virtual-based visit, um, this is a virtual check-in, as Kim just stated, being a brief five to 10 minutes of communication that is initiated by the patient with a practitioner via telephone or other telecommunication device to determine if an office visit is needed. 
for good um, practice or health care for uh, by a provider is to they can reach out to their patients therefore initiating the service per se but um, if it's to go any further than that then the provider just letting the patient know of the new telehealth services then the, the provider would need to gain consent and um, turn it into a telehealth service so for the next we're going to talk, we're gonna talk about the virtual check-ins. Here we have a list of the virtual check-in codes. Each consists of a five to 10 minute medical discussion. Cannot be related to an ENM service provided within the previous seven days, nor leading to an ENM service or procedure within the next 24 hours or soon as the appointment available. And also um, the tele, the virtual check-ins are for new and established patients. So first being the G2012, this is a brief discussion to determine if the patient needs additional healthcare. The G0071 is a communication for a rural health clinic or federally qualified healthcare center patient. 99441 is a telephone evaluation and management by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional. 98966 is an assessment and management service by a qualified non-physician healthcare professional. And the last one is G2010, which is an evaluation of a recorded video or images submitted by a patient, including interpretation and follow-up with the patient within 24 business hours by the provider. Next is the e-visits. They must occur through an online patient portal. This is a non-face-to-face -face service to an established patient. Time is cumulative over a seven-day period of the evaluation and management service for the same symptom. So for an example, the patient initiates an e-visit through the online patient portal on Monday for seven minutes. On Wednesday, of the same week, the patient initiates another e-visit for 15 minutes. At the end of the seven-day period, 99423 would be reported for a total of 22 minutes of time. For the e-visit service, it must be by a doctor, MD, PA, physician assistant, or NP for a nurse practitioner. On the next slide is e-visits performed by qualified non-physician healthcare professionals. They report the G2061 through G2063 for Medicare beneficiaries and for non-Medicare um, payers use codes 98970 through 98972. Same guidelines of the cumulative time during um, a seven day period of the evaluation and management service of the same symptom. And once again, also for um, an established patient. Licensed clinical social workers, clinical psychologists, clinical th um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech language pathologists can provide e-visits. Now we have telehealth services for the federally qualified health centers, known as the FQHCs, um, also in the rural health clinics, known as the RHCs. So these are um, specific to the virtual check-ins. They became effective of January 1st of 2019, where FQHCs and RHCs can receive payment for virtual check-ins for services when one, at least five minutes of communication technology-based or remote evaluation services are furnished. Two, an FQHC or RHC practitioner provides virtual communication service to a patient who has had an FQHC or RHC billable visit within the previous year. And three, the medical discuss 
discussion or remote evaluation is for a condition not related to an FQHC or RHC service provided within the previous seven days and does not lead up to an FQHC or RHC visit within the next 24 hours or at the soonest available appointment. So like I said in the previous slide, use code G0071, which is for virtual communication service, either alone or with other payable services. And then we provided you the link for some um, questions and answers provided by the um, FQHC and RHC. Next, we're gonna go over the televids documentation requirements. At minimum or at least the requirement, the documentation elements should include one notation of the patient's initiation and verbal or written consent to the televisit. Providers, once again, providers may contact patients to inform of the new televisit rules upon the patient's consent the provider can provide health care during that same call. Two, name of all people present during the televisit and their role. Three, chief complaint or reason of the televisit. Four, relevant history, background, and or results. Five, the assessment. Six, the plan of care or what the next steps are going to be. And seven is the total time spent of the televisit. There sure should be a start and a stop time. For those who are considered eligible telehealth providers, here is a list beginning with the physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistant, certified nurse midwives, certified or clinical nurse specialists, certified registered nurse anesthetists, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, registered dietitians or nutritional professionals. It's also standard for telehealth that the providers must be licensed in the state in which he or she is rendering services. But on March 18th of this year, President, Vice President Michael Pence announced that the Department of Health and Human Services will issue a regulation that allows the medical professionals to, pra to practice in states where they are not licensed. And next we have the originating sites, um, being of the office or the, of the physician or practitioner, hospital, critical access hospitals, rural health clinics, federally qualified health care centers, hospital-based or CAH-based renal dialysis centers, skilled nursing facilities, and last community mental health centers. Although um, telehealth visits typically include an originating site, CMS is now waiving the requirement, therefore patients can receive telehealth services in their homes. In addition, telehealth visits are usually limited to patients in rural areas, but CMS waived this requirement as well. For the distant site practitioners, um, the list be, um, this also is subject to state law, so it does need to be researched um, for, per each of your states, but the list goes on as physician nurse practitioners, physician assistants, certified nurse midwives, clinical nurse specialists, certified registered nurse anesthetists, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, registered dietitians, or nutrition professionals. Also, a medical professional is not required to present the beneficiary to the physician or practitioner unless it is medically necessary. The decision of medical necessity is made by the physician or practitioner at the distant site, and also uh, providers can perform um, these telehealth services um, in their own home as well. Back to you, Kim. Okay, thank you, Marie. All right, so as I addressed earlier, um, we are getting a lot of questions in regards to will patients owe a copay, um, specific to telehealth. So as we stated, many plans are saying they will waive copays until further notice. Um, some are automatically waiving it, and then others are giving, they're still gonna process with the copay, but give providers the option to waive that copay. So, and a lot of that's being driven off of CMS. So specifically for Medicare, 
um, CMS has stated the anti-kickback rule for any services paid by Medicare, Medicaid, or CHIP will not be enforced in regards to telehealth visits. So this does mean providers can reduce or waive cost sharing for telehealth visits without a penalty, but you're not going to be required to waive those fees. Um, Aetna is a payer that stated for the next 90 days that they will offer zero copay telemedicine visits for any reason. Humana has stated that they are currently going to waive member cost share for urgent telehealth visits over the next 90 days. Because of this, they are not advising for uh, providers to collect copayment from patients who have a Humana Medicare Advantage plan, a Humana Medicaid plan, or a commercial HSA um, for those telehealth services. Now, specific to Magellan Behavioral Health, so they have stated during this crisis that normal protocols have been waived to allow for telecommunications-based visits to be done, um, again, specific to behavioral health. But the last, that, the last update we received from Magellan, which I believe was last Tuesday, March 31st, that prior authorizations, that process would still be active. Now, specific to Medicaid, we are commonly being asked for state Medicaid guidelines. So the best resource to use to identify if your state has additional exceptions or if they're accepting the blanket waiver can be found at Medicaid.gov Medicaid using the link um, that's here on the slide, which again, you will be getting a copy of. Um, some other questions or FAQs that we have for telehealth. So can I provide telehealth virtual-based services to all patients and be reimbursed, or do they have to be experiencing symptoms of the coronavirus or be considered a high-risk patient? So uh, per CMS, during this public health emergency, they're not going to enforce that prior relationship requirement for telehealth or virtual-based visits, um, and they are allowing it for all patients. So another question, are telehealth documentation requirements the same as a face-to-face -face encounter? Um, so the use of a telecommunication system, of course, can substitute that in-person encounter, um, but your documentation requirements will stay the same. All that's seen, communicated, discussed, and treated should be reflected in that medical record documentation. So specific uh, to FQHCs and RHCs, I know Marie talked a little bit about that. Um, for the televisits, uh, televisit, e-visit, and virtual check-in. So specific to televisits or e-visits, both FQHCs and RHCs have been able to be an originating site in the past, but not a distant provider. They also were eligible to bill a fee for their facility being used as an originating site. So previously, the code uh, that both of those uh, types of settings had used is HCPCS code Q3014, with an appropriate revenue code of 0780. So um, we are still working to determine with CMS if they've been added as a distant site during the pandemic. Um, as of March 20th, there was no confirmed answer, um, but as, as you guys know, information is changing every single day um, and more exceptions are being put into place. So we will make sure all of those updates are put on our website. Um, specific to FQHCs, so Hawaii Medicaid did change their guideline to where a provider at an FQHC can be a distant site provider and covered at the FQHC PPS reimbursement rate, as long as the services are in their approved scope of practice, even when the patient is in their home. So that again is specific to FQHC practices, It's just an update we did receive from Hawaii Medicaid. So if you are an FQHC or, or RHC and interested in the Medicaid guidelines, um, you would again need to check medicaid.gov for that information. And then also for uh, virtual check-ins, um, we did already discuss that previously, but there is a link here um, under the bullet point for virtual check-ins that you can see further information in regards to FQHCs and RHCs uh, for those virtual check-in type services. So I also want to cover here quickly, are wellness visits eligible to be done and reimbursed through telehealth or virtual-based services? So since preventative visit codes, such as your 99391 to a 99397 code range, those are not reimbursed by CMS. So of course, they did not address those types of visits, but we are finding certain carriers are stating they will cover well visits to be completed and billed through telehealth. Um, an example that we have is Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, and we do have the link there as well that you can visit to uh, review further information. 
So some other items that I have um, are gonna be in regards to claim requirements. So what place of service do I bill for telehealth? And again, as we mentioned at the beginning, that has been ever changing, right? So the correct place of service usually for telehealth is 02, and that is still in place for visits considered true telehealth. Um, otherwise, like if you are in an office setting, which I know a lot of people join in and on this webinar are, um, then you would use place of service 11. Um, if you are providing those services normally in another place service, you would add you know, that appropriate place of service based on the setting. But essentially what, what we're saying is if the services would have been provided in person had this emergency not been going on, you're gonna build a place of service based on where it would have occurred. So again, we're gonna use example place of service 11. But if it's a true telehealth, based service, then you will bill place the service zero two. So some of the modifiers that are going to be appropriate, and again, some of these are payer specific, which we are working um, to put as many of those guidelines together in a condensed place as we possibly can. Um, but we do have modifier 95, modifier GQ, modifier GT, and then modifier G0. So I'm not gonna go through the specifics of those, but again, um, you will have these copies of the slides. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Meredith who will give us a demonstration um, and some more information about the telehealth feature within eClinical Works. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Marie, for all of that wonderful information. I know there's a lot going on, but as Kim said, I'm going to go through a short demonstration of televisits inside ECW, and I understand I'll point out a couple of things with the template, with the template that I use because I understand that many of you may not be using televisits, um, but there are still useful templates and guides that you can build inside of ETW to make your documentation easier. For televisits specifically inside of ETW, um, there is a cost associated with it. So it's $50 for 250 minutes, which can be used by all providers with a practice or $2 per call. During this time, um, currently it stands through June, ECW is capping the fee so either the cost in front of you, whichever one you choose, or the cap is $100 per provider. There is some setup required, and I recommend you that you use the E or the browser-based platform of ECW for televisits because it does not require you to download an extra Hilo agent. The Hilo agent is required on any desktop that you are running the EXE and want to practice televisits on. For the patient side, they will be required to have an email address um, and access this through portals or the Hilo application. So they must be web enabled in order to um, be able to log in and, and complete a televisit appointment. I'm going to switch my screen over to ECW. and go through the product activation. So product activation is, as per usual, under the administration band and product activation. From this screen, you simply scroll down to televisits, activate. At this point, you would be able to choose the pricing protocol that you want for your practice. So either that $50 per 250 minutes or $2 per visit. And then you'll be able to activate the participating providers. As you can see, a couple of mine have already been activated. Down towards the bottom, since I am in the browser version, I do not have to download this Kilo televis Televisit agent. However, again, if you were in the EXE platform, you would need to download that agent on every computer that you want to conduct televisits from. After activation, there is a little bit of setup. A couple of the steps, you need to create another visit type, under the admin admin band because as soon as you activate televisits the visit type codes will have the availability to select helo televisit and that would that is what gives you the capability on your resource schedule to then select televisit or however you name it as the visit type Now you can see I've already put on my resource schedule a televisit appointment. And there is also another jelly bean up here that gets added after the televisit is enabled for your provider. And it is a screen 
just like the office visit screen that, tele that shows your televisit appointments. As far as what the patient receives, they receive a confirmation email, and this is a template that comes built into ETW. And you can see it shows very directly that they can join the telemed appointment from this screen. They also have the capability to join from within their patient portal screen. Here we go. It comes on their appointment block here, join televisit, or if they were working from the application on their phone, see their screenshots, but it would say appointment, and then they would be able to click the televisit and join the appointment from there. For our demonstration, I'm going to click the link directly from my email. And the patient can enter vitals. However, if they don't want to enter any vitals, they don't have to. They can simply click Submit Vitals, and nothing's going to stop them from continuing. That is something you may want to let your patients know because there is no skip button here, so it could lead to some confusion. Following the vital screen, you'll see the televisit compatibility check. So the computer is now checking for my camera capability, my audio capability, and the connection and bandwidth. So whether I have um, a good enough connection to conduct this televisit appointment. And even if I don't, so it says proceed because my connection is suitable, um, but there have been times where my connection is not suitable, and you can still proceed after the patient clicks proceed, they will see a televisit consent form. After you enable televisit, you need to submit a ticket uh, to ECW to have this consent form enabled. And here you will want to check with your state guidelines as far as what they require for the patient to consent to. The patient can click accept and then proceed. And then they click start televisit. So I'm going to close out of this screen and start the televisit on my other computer so that I can show you from the provider's viewpoint. Now, when I refresh my jelly beans, you'll see that my televisit jelly bean is now red, which is the indicator to the provider that a patient is waiting to be seen. So I click into the patient's name to go to their progress note. And then the upper right is where my televisit join option will load. Now with televisits, you can also build and connect questionnaires to those televisit appointments. So the patient can fill out more information prior to joining their appointment as well. So I'm going to click start televisit. And here the provider should see two videos. So the big one is the patient. And then in the lower left, that's me as the provider. The provider can see to the questionnaire, and that is poor connection, probably because I'm streaming into two devices, but questionnaires, the vitals that I just filled out as the patient. They can also chat. So if the audio seems to be cutting out with the patient, as it may be with a poor connection, they can chat back and forth. They can also see trackers, and trackers are your Apple Watches, your Fitbits, because they can be connected to the portal, and that information may display here if the patient is using them and the provider has them enabled on the portal. A couple of other options at the bottom, the provider can pause their televisit, mute themselves, take a snapshot or entire screenshot if the patient is saying, oh, I have a bump here or I have a rash on my arm, um, can you check it out? The provider can take a shot of that and it will display on under the images section of the progress note. The provider may also flip their camera if they have a two, two cameras, so a front facing and a forward facing camera. They may also dock this video. So by using this little up arrow in the bottom left, I can dock it so that I can see more clearly the entire progress note and see my right chart panel. 
Now, again, we understand that you may not be using ECW's televisits as HHS has relaxed quite a few of the restrictions. However, you will still want to use a template to incorporate the required documentation that Marie went over earlier. So when I bring this Telehealth Universal template over, this template may be used for audio and or video appointments. And you can see it has everything that Marie discussed. So the, con the consent form, especially if you're not using ECW's televisits where the consent form is built in, you'll want to um, include it on your template. And I recommend including it even if you are using ECW's televisits. The platform, this is going to be the platform that you are using. So since those um, restrictions are relaxed at this time, you have options like FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, WhatsApp, and those options are all built in. And this is something that we can assist you with as well to build in those options so it makes it very easy for a provider to say, oh, I'm using ECW televisits this time. The individual is included, so the provider, the patient, perhaps it's a PEDS practice, we have a parent name, another family member. You can also build in nursing home staff, perhaps if you're seeing a patient in a nursing home, a caregiver, anything that's applicable to your practice. The patient location, home, office, remote, or home work and remote, the provider location, office, home, remote, maybe they're seeing patients from the hospital. And then the chief complaint through more than 50%. These are items that need to be documented in their respective sections. So the chief complaint should go in the chief complaint section, the assessment, of course, in the assessment, and so on. And we build them as part of the template um, to remind minders, but also for them to confirm that, yes, they've included this. And then as Marie mentioned, because some of these codes are dependent on time, you want to make sure to be documenting the start and end time for every single appointment. As soon as the provider is complete with the televisit, they can end the call by using the little red hang up button. They can check the patient out from there as well. So if they're truly done with their notes, they can check them out. The patient gets a notification that their call has been completed. If you are interested in televisits specifically through ECW, they are also offering webinars where they go through an even um, more comprehensive demonstration of televisits. And there are some upcoming ones today, the 9th and the 10th. And they have, these are all in the EXE version. They also have browser ones available, but they are not available until I think the 20th. But if you can watch the EXE platform um, webinar, it's even easier in the E because again, you don't have to download that extra Hilo agent. I'm going to pass it back to Kim for a couple of more slides. All right, thank you, Meredith. Okay, so we are briefly just going to touch base on some of the resources available to prepare for the healthcare business impacts of COVID-19. So we're facing a tremendous amount of uncertainty as our country continues to battle COVID-19, which includes understanding the long-term impact it will have on healthcare. While the full impact is unknown, one thing is for sure, and that is that COVID-19 will inevitably impact revenue cycle management. Um, many organizations we found were quick to implement telehealth to replace in-person visits to minimize the spread of COVID-19, and it's best to continue that, uh, that proactive approach involving an action plan to avoid financial distress during this global pandemic. So while we're adjusting to this new normal, it may be necessary to tap into other resources of operating capital or explore temporary partnerships. So we do have a summary of these available options, um, and they can be found on our website, revelmd.com. If you go to our blog, you will then see it should be um, the most recent blog published, um, just titled Resources to Prepare for the Healthcare Business Impacts of COVID-19. Um, so many of those options, and we have um, all the ones that are covered on in that blog are listed here um, on the slide from all the way from the CARES Act all, and down to the CMS Accelerated and Advanced Payment Program. Um, many of these options do fall under the CARES Act, so Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security. 
Um, this is the largest stimulus bill in U.S. history with $2 trillion in allocations. So as the third stimulus bill um, passed by Congress in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, the CARES Act offers relief and support for small businesses, including within the U.S. healthcare industry. So I do just want to make sure to put this out there. Though we have researched and provided a summary of the available options, it's important to know that Revell does not provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Um, this material has been prepared for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for tax, legal, or accounting advice. Um, if you do want to check out these options, this is a great place to see a summary and available web links to all of those options. But we do recommend for you to consult your tax, legal, and accounting advisors before engaging in any types of transactions um, related to this preparedness for the financial impact of COVID-19. All right, thank you again, Kim and Marie. We have a couple of questions that came through and we have a few minutes left. Um, so is billing level based on time or medical decision-making? For physical therapists? Is, uh, um, that's what I'm assuming it means. Please let me know if, if I'm if I'm wrong here. Okay, so if you are referring to physical therapists, physical therapists, um, yes, it is mandatory that um, their time is in their documentation, and a lot of their com their codes are time based. So. Oh, okay. So here's clarification. So you meant for M for an MD, but for patient follow up visits and in regards to Medicare versus commercial. So for an MD, for patient follow-up visits, um, oh. that same billing level based on time or medical decision-making. Currently, as of date of April 6th of 2020, we are to be, um, we are not using that format on leveling an e &M code that actually takes place come January 1st of 2021, where the um, key factor will be time versus medical decision making. So um, I have heard that the, uh, the government would like to pass that earlier, but I know as well as I know right now for April 6th of 2020, we are still using the old fashioned um, of three components, history, examination, medical decision-making, unless um, the encounter has over a 50% time of counseling and or coordination of care. Okay, thank you, Marie. And that's for both Medicare and commercial payers, correct? At this time, yes. Perfect, thank you. All right. Um, well, those were actually all the questions that we had. If anybody else has any, feel free um, to submit them via the question slot on the right side. Otherwise, we are almost at our hour of time here. But thank you all for joining. And again, we will send out these slides along with a Q&A. And we appreciate your joining our call.